Hello, everyone. My guest today is Saba Kanajad. He is the founder of a company, co-founder and CEO of Veed, an online video editing platform. All right, Saba, you ready to take us to the top? Let's go. Let's do All it. Right. So how would you get into this space? Were you like an ex-video producer at a cable network or something? How would you, you think of this problem? Not at all. Um, my background, I went to art school. I worked in creative technology, advertising agencies, branding agencies, and just kind of found myself into video. I just liked it. Interesting. Okay, so you came on the show actually back in... Um, no, no, sorry, you didn't come on. I found you via Indie Hackers because you had... Yes. S- there, there's some good growth. I think you'd passed... What, what, what was revenue? 100, 110 grand a month? When? Now? Uh, when was it when you posted on Indie Hackers? Do you remember when you posted? Uh, we did a 1 million ARR. Yeah, uh, we're about one and a half now. When did you hit a million in ARR? Do you remember? Mm, two months ago. Oh, just recently. Okay, so you're growing pretty quickly here. Okay, so, okay, so give us the backstory. What year did you launch the company in? Uh, launched the company technically uh, about two years ago, but went full time on it about 14 months ago. And that's when we started charging. Okay, uh, and who is we? We, uh, me and my co founder, Tim, two years ago. Uh, and then a few months after that, we got a couple of developers to help us out. And then, yeah, we just went full-time, quit our jobs uh, 14 months ago. And that's, yeah, when we started charging. Very cool. And, you know, obviously the biggest question for any hacker getting started is, I have a co-founder. How do we have the tough equity question? If you're lazy, you split it 50-50. If you do it right, someone is usually has a little more or a little less. How did you guys do it? That's not the right way to do it. If you're doing it that way, then you shouldn't be your co-founder. I mean, like, come <laughs> so on. So you split 50-50. Um, you, I mean, like, you're going to be doing this for years, hopefully, and you're going to make a really big company. If you, you, Everyone needs to be incentivized from your co-founders to your employees. So, you know, just don't be greedy of equity. Give it away and get everyone on board, right? I think clarity is also very important, and it's clear and it's helpful to understand who is leading the company, which is why I always advocate that someone owns more than 50%. Uh, it just makes it crystal clear how things are working. Completely disagree with that. Very good. Have you guys ever you disagreed have role, on a question? You have, you have you. I mean, you have roles in a company, right? So, like, someone's CEO, someone's a CTO, and I'm CEO of the company, and Tim's CTO. He makes and leads conversations and decisions in technology, and I'm not going to push, push back on that. And I'll take strategic decisions for the company, and he probably doesn't push back on that. Like, we do push on each other, but like fundamentally, you know, we I think we're aligned, and maybe that's just you know the synergy that we have and other co-founders that be different, but I'm a massive component for being 50, 50. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. So you jump into this, uh, you quit your full-time job. What was the company doing in terms of revenue when you decided to finally quit your full-time gig, both of you? Yeah. So zero. Interesting. So, so I mean, that must've been a scary time. You're not sure if you're going to get revenue. You have some life savings built up. How much, I mean, how many runway, how much life runway did you have when you quit your job? So about four or five months. Interesting. Was that nervous, or did it make you nervous? Yeah, yeah. How did you? Yeah, I mean, do that? like you know, you got. I mean, like you know, I'm single. Um, I don't have a mortgage. I'm like relatively young. I can get contract work if I need to, um, relatively quickly. So it didn't seem like a massive decision at the time. I think the thing that we we're more scared about was getting to profitability super quick, so we didn't have to go back to our jobs. That's that's what we we're worried about. Mm-hmm. Are you profitable today? Yeah, yeah, we've always, I mean, you know, once we had this really beautiful moment where our savings and our revenue crossed over at this perfect point. Um, so, yeah, no, we've, yeah, we've been profitable since then, basically, and still profitable now. That's great. And when you say profitable, like 10% of the bottom line, 50% of the bottom line each month? No, no. I mean, you know, like three, four months ago, our runway was zero and we'd spend everything we would on, you know, growth and putting it back into the company. Now we're probably putting away about 30%. That's great. So what do you do with that, right? Any founder, indie hacker reaches that beautiful moment where you start to have some cash flow and you go, do we just, do we pay ourselves more or do we leave it in the company and reinvest it? Yeah. So, I mean, like, I think it depends. Like we were paying ourselves about $2,000 a month until, I mean, even to the million, I think when we hit a million ARR, we paid ourselves more than $2,000 a month. Um, and we don't, even today, we don't need to pay ourselves any, any more. We're more than happy with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely reinvest it in growth. Like it's, if you have a company that's growing, it's hungry and it, it needs it, right? It needs more people on customer service. It needs more people in design, needs more development to keep it moving forward. And, you know, you don't want to stunt that growth. So put it straight back in. What is the team size today? Uh, we're just 20 now, I think. That just, yeah, just crossed that yesterday. 20 folks, very good. And how many engineers? Uh, I think a good 50%, yeah. 50, including, uh, including Tim. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Interesting. Okay. So tell me more about the product, right? So, so obviously you've got some customers on the product. How are they using it? What, what do you help them do? So there's a bunch of things that we help them do. Um, I mean, when you make a tool in general, it's, it's very broad. It, you know, attracts different types of people with different use cases. But the ones that we see really uh, that are really powerful is uh, subtitling content. So most videos on social um, play without audio. So subtitling is a really great way to, you know, help people um, consume that content, but then also for accessibility reasons. So we have a lot of governments and educational institutions as well using it for that reason. We have a lot of podcasters kind of turning the audio into, um, you know, the waveform videos. I think I've seen you do some of those. No, you, have I? No, maybe not. Maybe someone we, else. We, we've tested you know the, it. You know the ones I mean. Yeah. What do you find? I mean, what, the, the issue for me is it's, a, it's, it's, it's less about does the tool do what it says it does. It's more about we do one episode a day. So like it's, that's too, if, it, if they call them audiograms, right? If I did an audiogram every day, there's just, I would overwhelm my Twitter feed with audiograms. So it's just more yeah. about, we strategically do one here or there. And my internal team typically takes care of it. But, but I know this is a very hot space. I mean, we just had, um, I forget the founder's name, but I think the company called wave just came on and they're doing about yeah. the same amount and they only really do sort of podcast audiograms. Amazing, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of use cases, that's that's another one. But also just, you know, a lot of people make the Gary Vee style videos for LinkedIn. A lot of people trim content into different snippets, get it out in different channels. You know, there's a bunch of different things. And as the tool's getting more complex, you can do, you know, more and more things of it. And that opens up the use cases and the market size as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's interesting, I mean, my first company, Heyo, was a full drag and drop Facebook application builder. And I remember with our dev team and our sprint seconds, we'd say, what we need is if they can drag and drop to create anything. We finally spent like months building a freeform drag and drop thing, which when I go to your homepage and I look at sort of how you have drag and drop here, it's sort of the same. But what we found is when we gave people all that freedom, they created really shitty designs. So yeah. we're like, well, crap, maybe after we, we have to take away some of the freedom to make sure it's high quality. How do you balance that? Right. It's an interesting question. I think, you know, the same on Canva. You look at Canva templates and you're like, these look amazing. And then someone goes in there like, oh yeah, but I want Comic Sans because it looks really friendly. And this stock video from Shutterstock, it's beautiful, right? So, I mean, you've got to give them enough freedom for them to make a mistake, right? But you just kind of want to push them in the right direction. So, you know, we don't, you know, we, you know, we actually give our users as much freedom as they like. And we, it's, it, it's an interesting question. I think, you know, I think the most important thing is at least as long as the user feels really, really comfortable using the product and making those changes, it's great. If they feel scared using the product and they're going to mess something up, then they're not going to be very confident and creative. So, you know, let them go. How many customers do you have today? Uh, 5,000, just under 5,500. 5,500. Interesting. So what does that mean? How much are they paying per month on average? Uh, average. So we've got a $30 and we've got a $15. And I think the average is 22, 22, 50 when you yeah. add it all up and yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. And, and so let me, I mean, you do a very unique thing on your homepage, which you just, you, you there's not really like enter your email, sign up for a trial. It's just upload a video and start using the thing. I'm curious what yeah. this looks like. So, so how many people sort of hit your website each month and how many new like how many people click upload video and actually upload a video each month? Yeah, I um, don't know. No idea. I mean, right. I know how many people hit there. You know, we've got about 10,000 people hit the site every day. Um, how many, how many upload? About, upload, uh, let's say like 6,000 maybe. Okay, that, that's 7, actually 60% so 6, upload some sort of video file. Yeah, no, we're pretty good on that, to be honest. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of people who do like 20 videos a day. We had this guy doing like 100 videos a day and it was crazy. But like, you know, there's skewed in that. But, you know, a lot of people that upload and try it out. And, you know, you can also enter URLs from YouTube and stuff like this. So mm -hmm. so I love that you put the utility value of the product right at the front. But at some point, you have to pick the perfect moment to show that paywall or that trial wall where you have to get the email and get an account set up. What's the activation metric you want to see a user hit before you show them the actual sign up or paywall? Yeah, interesting. I mean, we give away as much value as possible up front and we can do that. Um, you know, when they download the video and there's a watermark, they've got a decision, right? If they're a company, business or an influencer, you know, it's in their best interest to remove it because it's their content. But a free user who just maybe wants to put something on Reddit doesn't mind the watermark, but that's great marketing for us. So yeah, we just put all the value up front. And if they want to get rid of the watermark and become a subscriber, they can for, you know, 15 or $30 a month. And how many new customers did you add over the past 30 days? 
Firstly, I don't know that. We did uh, we did uh, 80 yesterday, which was good. Um, anywhere between anywhere between like 60 to 80 a day, something like that. So, so is it fair to say if we just look at a flashpoint, the average day at Veed looks like 10,000 unique website hits, 6,000 uploads, of which 80 convert into a new customer? Yeah, sounds about right. Something like that. Very interesting. No, I'd, I'd say, I, I would say, no, I would say renders. I would say, you know, I, would, I don't know about unique uploads, but unique renders a day was about 6,000. What's the difference between an upload and a render? Well, an upload is probably, uh, yeah, that's a good question, actually. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, so in general, we're not like super hot on funnels, conversions and stuff like this. Like we spend most of our time talking to our users, understanding what their needs are and what their jobs to be done is, right? And we just, yeah, and the, and the reason why we're not like going deep on these funnels is because we're just not at that stage yet. We're still at this stage of trying to build the product, understand who our user is. And I think there will become a time where we start looking really deep into these metrics and starting tightening up all the funnels and, you know, tracking what happens at every stage. But right now, I think we have a good understanding of our user and, who you know, how they want to use the products. And, you know, we can see that in the, in the revenue metrics, right? Mm -hmm. How much have you raised or are you bootstrapped today? No, we haven't raised any money. I love that. So totally, any plans to raise? No. What if someone that was hyper strategic came along? They did. No, I was joking. No, they did. Actually, yeah. I should, I, sh well, why didn't no, you? Why, why wouldn't no. you? If, if, someone culturally, why? if someone culturally aligned with you and could help yeah. get your product into the hands of more creators and you mm -hmm. like the deal terms, you'd still be opposed to, you'd still be opposed to taking outside capital. So look, let me, this is the way that I'm looking at it. I see a very comfortable, like I, I kind of see a decent path for the next couple of years to get us to 10 million ARR. And I think there's a very good possibility we're going to get there and we're going to get there relatively efficiently. Um, you know, now is not the right time. We haven't, literally our head of growth hasn't even started yet. We haven't even started doubling down our acquisition channels. Like once we do that, I'm going to feel really comfortable. Um, yeah, I just feel like it's too early. It's just way too early. Like well, what if, like, so, so here's one thing. Apple, here's one, Apple's here's one. not going to make Capital is not going to make us grow any faster right now. I can't see that happening. And in terms of acquisition, if we were to entertain that now, it's way too early unless the revenue multiplier is really, really good, right? Well, okay. So, so at all fairness, I think you're missing like a critical point though. What if someone that came along that could be your head of growth, but is already wealthy and has had success, so you can't hire them. You could not get their strategic thing without letting them write a check to invest in the company. So then mm. you're essentially not even paying them a salary. They wrote you a check to invest and they over time actually become your full-time head of growth. Why don't founders in your stage ever think about the fact that letting someone put in money is a much cheaper way to get very smart talent on your team? I completely agree. I've emailed Gary V like 50 times. Yeah, but he's, he's not going to be your head of growth. Well. He's, he has exactly. no time. For yeah, I think I think the way that I the way that I think about this um, is like the people that you're talking about, um, they've already done it, right? They don't want to do it again. They might want to do it again, but we need to find the people who are going to step into their shoes, who is going to be the next dot dot dot. And like, I actually think we've been very successful at finding and hiring those people. And I do. Why what hire them? Why hire them though? And hit your hit your headcount expense. Why not find someone like that and let them invest, and then they'll do it for free because you let them invest. I don't know who these people are that you're talking about, but I'd love to know who they are. You look at head of growth at Gary V, not Gary V, but the head of, you look at everyone who's in so the, the third, fourth, and fifth so spot. The head of growth at Canva. For, no, head of growth at Canva. it's a multi-billion dollar company. Why would they leave, why would they leave Canva and join you? You have to find people exactly. that are like just below that, right? So where, where they see your growth, they see the incentive structure and then get something from you that they can't get at Canva or at VaynerMedia. I think we've, I think, I think like, um, yeah, no, I, no, I get, I get what, you, I get what you're saying, but I, I feel, I feel, I feel good about who we've just got as our head of growth and has been trained by the best. So, yeah. Sorry, I, my, my, my question though, you're, you're missing my, my, my question is why don't founders in your shoes, when I say, would you take capital from a strategic partner? The answer is we're not, we don't want an acquisition and we're too early. They, people never think about investors as free labor which is, I think, a very smart way to think about it. I mean, look at how Buffer grew. They took $20,000 yeah. from 150 influencers, right? Like that was their growth channel. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so I th and we could go around in circles about this all day, I suppose. Um, but I think, you know, I think, great, that worked for Buffer. But I think we've got a good growth channel at the moment. It's working super well. Like, I've, I mean, like, do I want to put more fuel on the fight? Yes, like, but I'm not... I'm, Maybe I'm just not in a position where 
or we're in a position that we need to do it. I, I don't know. I, I'm happy to look more into it, definitely. But I just that opportunity hasn't come about, and it, I, yeah. Yeah, no, it makes good sense. I'm just, I'm pushing you to just get in your head more. That's all. No, all I, right. no, I think, I think that's, I think, I think it's a fair point. But I haven't been proposed for that opportunity, and I don't know who those people would be, yeah. and I haven't come across it. But I'm sure if I did, and it looked like an incredible opportunity, then I would 100 percent snap their hand off and take that. Yeah, are folks sticky once they join? What's the what's the churn look like? Uh, churn is about 13, percent so you know, much higher than a normal SaaS company, should we say? But you know, like the way that we think about this is. Um, is uh, you work in a marketing department, you get asked to subtitle a video or clip a webinar or whatever. You come on, you do the job, you pay, and then you leave, right? And um, actually, I'm going to put our churn messages on our website as testimonials because I think they're really good. And, you know, we're happy of people using it once, but the reactivation rates are great, so they come back, you know? So why do you choose to measure churn then on a monthly basis? If they always come back, why not measure it on an annual basis and measure it as, do they create at least 10 videos per year on the platform? Yeah, I mean, it, I suppose you, you're right, um, but it's just because we haven't been like super, super data driven on this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, churn, I'm, I mean, I'm comfortable with people using it just for one video, and I think there's enough people staying and there's enough people coming back that I feel like it's pretty healthy. Yeah. Um, yeah, which you're, talking, just to be clear, you're talking 13% per month, right? So about a, you churn through your entire customer base each year, about 150% annual mm. churn. No, we retain about 30%. Of, so the people that first joined a year ago, we got about 30% of that first cohort still on. Got it, got it, got it. So, so really what's happening here is you have 70... Month, drop, and then exactly, it drops out like that. Yeah. Exactly. You, you, your top of funnel is so wide. You're getting yeah. some people that only just come in and use it once and fall out. But for people that signed up a year ago and stuff, you, you have about 70% retention. Or sorry, 70% yeah. churn, 30% retained. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Very interesting. Are you doing any that's, experiments? That's, that's, stack, that's stacking up as well. So like, you know, the, the the product we had a year ago is not what we have now, right? So that's, we can see that cohort by cohort getting much, much better. Yep. Um, besides your watermark on videos, are you doing any sort of other tactics to drive growth, uh, paid marketing, anything like that? No, we haven't done any paid. Um, maybe that's something we experiment with in the future. Um, mainly content, SEO, um, you know, as I said, building out this sort of like jobs to be done framework where, you know, people have a job, we just need to intercept them. We also have a, we're doing really nice stuff on YouTube at the moment. Alec, incredible. He's been making YouTube video for us every single day for like four months. And that's Wait, who, who, is, like, who is Alec? <laughs> Alec. Oh, he's incredible. Um, he Googled social media jobs in London and we were the first link apparently. And, uh, he's been making a one YouTube video for us on our YouTube channel every day. So if you go onto like YouTube and put like auto subtitle video, um, he should come up. Hold on. What's your YouTube account? Is it Veed Studio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Veed Studio, yeah. Got it. So you found him. I, I see him. Yeah, I see him. Um, so he's, you, you, he's full-time on the team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, so I see like one he posted five days ago, how to screen record a specific window or entire thing has gotten 55 views. He's extremely consistent though. in putting these things up and yeah, great, with, amazing, right? great with the thumbnails. Yeah, this is super interesting. So, I mean, would yeah, you credit the YouTube to more. one of your number one acquisition yeah. channels? Uh, I believe it will be. Yeah. And I, I, the other thing that's super interesting about YouTube is like, we're, we're getting the number zero spot on Google with it, right? And we've been yeah. experimenting with how to do that. And it's just super powerful, especially when a lot of the search terms are at video. It's very natural to show a video, you know, for Google in that in that space. Yeah, good stuff. And All also right. cap, cap, captioning those videos as well and putting those segments in it also resolves search terms as well. And they can Google can give you the perfect part of the video, which is great too. Yeah, let's, uh, let's wrap up here, uh, Saba, with the famous five. Number one, favorite business book. Uh, I read Seven Powers recently, which is the foundation of business strategy, which is a very good one about defensibility and, you know, thinking strategically about your business. All right. We will we will wrap up with Al Saba. I'm not sure what happened there, guys, but you just learned about Veed.io. Again, a company that's passed 1.3 million bucks in ARR. They have over 5,500 customers helping people quickly create audiograms for their podcasts for marketing purposes. Continuing to scale, totally bootstrap team of 20 today. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. One founder comes on, three hungry buyers, they try and do a deal live and the founder shares back-end dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, 
ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember, these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at nathanlacka.com forward slash slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right, I'll be in the comments. See ya.